Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs Podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. It's the Maryland Crabs. I'm excited today. Why do you always sing that? Because I'm not allowed to sing in my house. No? Mm -mm. It's a long-standing rule. That's a shame. I don't want to get into it. This is our last mayoral interview today. It is. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. It was insightful. It was interesting because uh, this is why people ask why we do hour-long interviews. I don't think that you can really get someone to loosen up till they're 10, 15, 20 minutes into it. And then they start to loosen up. They get a little bit tired, a little mentally tired, and then the truth starts coming out. Not I, that we're... I'll tell you, we've got an interview coming up with County Executive Steve Shu, and that perfectly illustrates your point. Right, on that. because we were on the we, clock. We, yeah, we had a tight schedule because he had to be someplace with like the governor or something, some kind of a bullshit excuse to get nice. out. But it was, uh, but no, you know but, what? you're but, not going to book guests anymore. But you're absolutely right though. It, t- it took 20 minutes before he like loosened the tie and he was doing shots. And then they hustled him out. <laughs> and then he had to leave. It was horrible. Yeah. So. <laughs> but actually, actually that was, a, that was also a good interview uh, as all of them are. Yeah, it but was good. Last week with Mayor Mike Panelides and I was listening to it for the first time when I listened to it on my phone because I subscribe to the Maryland. You Crabs have to subscribe, podcast. John. You have uh, to. I was walking my circles at the Pitt Moyer Rec Center, and all of a sudden, my phone went bling. You've got a new episode uh, because I hadn't heard the Mike Panelides. You have a stupid sounding phone. <laughs> yeah, well, because when I did do the editing, or well, you did most of the editing, but when I put it together, I didn't listen really to him because I was tight for time. So it was really fascinating to sit there and listen to him. And I, I, you know, he really, really threw down the gauntlet to Crystal Spring, didn't he? Well, I think he's making some bold moves. I think uh, everyone's making some bold moves in this one that I really find interesting. So he's, he is putting the line down where he stands as far as the issues. And I think there's no gray area there. So Crystal Spring is going to be one of those battlegrounds for him where, and it was last time too. So if it worked the first time, sure, it, it, won, it time. won for him last time. And it's funny, it's been going, Crystal Spring has been going on so long long that it is affecting two separate mayoral elections. It's almost like the market house. And you had some <laughs> thoughts about that last week in your Ion Annapolis rant. I did. Some called it an epic rant on the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief. If you want to check that out, it would have been on Thursday, September 7th. So last week, right? About last Thursday. The, about the market house and the city's... You have a dim view towards the way the city has handled yeah, I, everything. Yeah, you know, I figured we pissed off all the restaurants. You know, you know, piss off all the politicians. That'll be fine, too. But yeah, I, I thought Mike was, was very strong. And I had a conversation with an alderman who was wondering whether that was going to help him or hurt him in the election. And I can see both sides of it. He could obviously play to the people that are opposed to Crystal Springs, and that could help him very much. Or it could hurt him because he played that card the last time. Yeah, but I think if so, if you look at, at how it's broken down by ward and who is the most involved in city politics, I mean, stereotypically, and I'm making a broad statement here, I think Ward 1 is going to be, and Ward 8, are probably the wards that are most involved in the politics of the city. And they're going to have the higher turnouts. They're going to have the higher turnouts. And they don't really care that much about Crystal Spring. I think that Eastport is more tied up in their own development issues. So it's going to affect more the people in Ward 5 and 7. I think if that's the case, they don't vote in the percentages that I think the other wards do. I'd have to look at those numbers again. So for him to oppose uh, Crystal Spring, there's no downside to that for him. I, I just don't think there's a downside for him to oppose it. It worked last time. It's going to work this time. Right. Uh, I think the Eastport one might be a little stickier. Right. Well, I think I think all of the interviews with the mayors were very, very good. I think, you know, Gavin certainly is is the idea candidate. He's the one that's the, the changing. Do you know what happened right there, by the way? I, I started an argument with, with, and then I disproved my own premise, and then I confused myself and just rambled on. That's not happened. That's not hard to do. No, no. I, I did halfway through, I'm like, no, wait, that, that theory is totally wrong. So forget what I just said. I'm not going to even edit that because I'm too lazy. <laughs> but, Gavin, uh, you know, and, sorry. And, and, I mean, and, and Nev- Nevin had some very salient, very solid points. I like Nevin. You know, I Nevin is that dark horse that came out of nowhere, and I really like his thought process. He's he's a very thoughtful guy. I think the way he communicates is, may not be as polished as the other three, but I think that his ideas are really really interesting. And since he's so nakedly involved on social media, in that it's not he's not putting out 
a uh, someone handling his social media or he doesn't have it's not part of the campaign when he comments on something it's him and it's he's very honest about it so if you go on the esport is. forum I think, I think he's real and I think he's honest uh, right. whether you agree with his beliefs or thoughts is a different story and he's not toting any party line at all no uh, I mean he was at, went and testified before the county council last week and uh, called for the resignation of Michael Peruca, which has been that you know the surge group that has been calling for that as well because of his association with League of the South. I guess I, you know, and I don't want to go off on a side rant here, but I mean, if we elect somebody and everyone knows everything, they, they know all that about a candidate when he's elected. At that point, then what's the point of having them step down? He was elected when people knew about it, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there you are. Yeah, it's not something that came to light no. just yesterday. So that's kind of interesting, but. Before we get into our final candidate, which is State Senator John Astle, who will be here in just a few moments, uh, make sure that you do subscribe to the Maryland Crabs, and you can do that on iTunes or Google Play. Subscribing is important because you can listen to us on the Facebook, you can listen to us on YouTube, but when you subscribe, it's delivered to you every week and you don't miss an episode. Right. Right to your phone. Right. You can go to the MarylandCrabs.com and the episodes are there. They always will be there for you, but the subscription really works. Leave a review. Uh, leave us a couple stars if you'd like. A couple. Definitely check out the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief, which is something I launched September 1st. You did. It, it, I'm so proud of you. He's worked so hard on that. And it's just, all, his little news brief. Own, yeah. And he goes, like, what do you think? And I'll make a suggestion. And he goes, I don't think so. I'm like, okay. Well, I heard uh, Scott McMullen is, you know, who's always one real quick with the criticisms. Of the Annapolis podcast. Yep. Uh, and great podcast, but he's always quick with the criticism. He says, this needs to be done during drive time. I'm like, well, fine. Hire me a producer and we'll get it done, <laughs> we'll get it done in well, drive time. You guys time. are all early risers. I'm not. So I can't do it but it's you know it's but the ones i listen to are like eight nine ten minutes so it just gives you kind of the brief for the day yeah it's about 10 minutes and it, at most what's it called again that's the ion annapolis it's called the ion annapolis daily news brief it's not real original I like uh, it. it is posted up on ionannapolis.net obviously it's but on subscribe, like apple podcasts and all that stuff it'll come right to your phone but yeah if you need to find us here and we're still looking for suggestions of people to talk to and topics to cover here at the maryland crabs podcast we've gotten a few a few really good ones a mm -hmm. few questionable ones people and this is exciting though because you know once we get this election crap out of the oh, way by the way frank zap is dead so thanks for the suggestion but, yeah. <laughs> i did see that one <laughs> but yeah so uh keep sending them in you can send them into info at the maryland .com. you can Contact us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast, Facebook, the Maryland Crabs Podcast. We've got a page and a group. And that's pretty much all the ways you can contact and you're, us. Yeah, you're still resisting Instagram, which actually I started talking into it, but then I would have to set it up. And I just don't want to do that. So. Yeah, we know how you do on setup. But nope. all right, well, let's pay some bills and let's talk to Senator Astle. What do you think? When you're a community bank, you help your community however you can, like being there for local business people. Backing them up when they start up. Advising them when they ask. Standing by them so they can grow. Helping local businesses is one of the most important things we do at Severn Bank. I'm Alan Hyatt, Chairman of the Bank, but I'm also a proud supporter of businesses in Anne Arundel County. You know we never forget that here at the bank, we're a local business too. We face the same challenges and opportunities as any business. And we know how fortunate we are to have customers who stand beside us. That's why we stand beside you. If you have a business or you want to start a business, talk with us. Because we're banking on you. Severn Bank, here with you. Online at SevernBank.com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Severn Bank is a trade name used by Severn Savings Bank. Hi, this is Tyler from Mountain Wolf. Tickets on sale now for Amps and Ales Music and Craft Beer Festival. Live music from noon to eight. Seven bands including People's Blues of Richmond, Higher Hands, Mountain Wolf, Def Scene, and so much more. Amps and Ales features 27 of the finest craft breweries in the nation. We'll be pouring Flying Dog, Heavy Seas, Jailbreak, and many more, plus games, shopping, and ballpark eats. Saturday, September 16th at Prince George's Stadium. Tickets at AmpsandAles.com. That's AmpsandAles.com. And we are here with State Senator John Astle again, who actually earned his twofer badge today. This is the second time you've been on our podcast. Oh, well, I get like a certificate. Well, no, you do. That. It's in the mail. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the mail. And I expect to see it hanging on the wall of some of your office should you in, win. In an appropriate place. <laughs> I'll ensure that. So whenever take, anyone uses the bathroom, take down one of the right deadheads. No, no. Now the deadheads are gone. <laughs> I, I told you the last time, they're gone. They <laughs> found right. a new home. We're up, out, up in the mountains, right? Yeah. Oh, the stuffed heads. 
I yeah. thought you were like a Grateful Dead fan. No, I'm like, no. you don't look like no, 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 I don't look like one. <laughs> we could talk about Bertha. Talk, you know, <laughs> well, let, let's let's get into it. Talk a little bit about your campaign. And you're running for mayor of Annapolis. You've been running unofficially since late 2016. You declared, I think, early in 2017. I did. Uh, like March, right after, sort of shortly. Well, I didn't officially declare until after the session was over, which was in April. You know, one of the things that you talked about the last time we were here was you know, sort of a regiment. And one thing that sort of impressed me is that you said that you would have a meeting once a week or at a certain interval and say, hey, okay, what are you working on and how do we get you from point A to point B? And it's so bringing so a discipline to the there. process. Um, sure. So I think that's something that any municipal city government does lack is uh, there's going to be everyone's criticism is saying that they're not efficient. And that's the complaint with government in general. And why can't we run business government like a business? And, and the well, reason being because it's not a business. You can't run government like a business. No. I mean, we know, we know that. I mean, we hear candidates say that all the time. I'm going to run it like a business. But the truth is government's different. The processes are different. But one thing that is the same, I think, in both arenas is communication. You have to communicate in order to get anything done. And I think that's one of the failings uh, we have in the city now, that the council is not included on a lot of these issues on the front side. I learned in the legislature a long time ago that if you're going to build a coalition to get an issue passed, you need the votes. And to get the votes, you need to communicate to the people who are going to be expected to cast those votes. And you bring them in at the very beginning because compromise is, is the answer. So you lay an issue out and somebody says, you know, I kind of like that, but I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable and I, if I can we, we get a little tweak here. Okay. So you finally come to... Um, where you got to be and then you got everybody on board and the bill comes out and uh, boom it passes so let me throw a hypothetical out at you so we're talking about a process that is broken down in city council there's always been a adversarial positioning between the mayor and the council and like i said before that's pretty much by design that's good check and balance i mean not not hostile but you're going to have that push and pull and you, you really should but there's times where as mayor you're going to have to coalesce around an issue and you have to be the leader. Let's take the market house debacle and we've called that a debacle from a couple months ago and next week sure. I think they're gonna vote on that again or it'll be a few days ago when people hear this. If you were mayor, there was a, the RFP a request for proposal for the market house. Uh, we had three groups who responded and they went through two committee meetings and they brought it to a vote and the vote was to who we were gonna choose that was going to get the RFP and council kind of uh, hemmed and hawed and at the end they said, you know what? None of these groups met the criteria at the RFP, so we're going to kick this can down the road. If you were mayor at that point, how would you have handled the whole Market House uh, vote situation? Well, let's start at the beginning with the RFP. Uh, I've heard from a number of experts that the RFP was flawed in, in the way it was drafted. And so what we got was a flawed result from a flawed RFP. So right now, um, I'd like to see him just get it over with and get it behind us and move forward. But I'm not sure. I think that's, they want that now, too. I think they regret yeah, even bringing I, it up. I'm not sure that's going to happen. And I think the next administration is going to have to deal with it. But um, it's an issue that should have been dealt with a long time ago. It's been festering for far too long, which I might say is the process for a lot of issues in the city. They fester because the city is reluctant to make decisions. You know, sometimes these decisions are hard. But you got to make them. Oh, well, we've seen that. I mean, the, the joke has been that you know, there's some closet down in City Hall somewhere which houses study after study after study after study. It's probably right after the Th Annapolis 300 medallions. Yeah, that there's they a, found there's a, a closet full of those somewhere. Ago, but, um, you know, there's, there's lots of studies that just nothing ever really is acted upon them. And that's not endemic to this particular city council or this administration. This has been going on for a long time, and it probably goes on in other cities, but there's that, once you are elected, there's that hesitancy to act because you're not going to please everybody. So even if they had selected one of the proponents of the RFP, they would have probably got some blowback from a certain amount of people, but that sure. comes with the job. It comes with the job. You know, in a time that I've been in the General Assembly, uh, there have been issues that I've cast votes on, and I got a lot of blowback. But I cast a vote that I thought was the right vote for the issue at the time and you have to have the courage to do that there are people that have said ugly things about me john yeah. well no decision is the worst decision you know yeah, you, i agree you, you, i absolutely agree you can make good decisions bad decisions and no decisions and no and and that's what we have here uh three issues where we got no decision what would you want to do with the market house honestly i'd like to see us start over from scratch to to do 
an RFP to get the people that know what they're doing to get an RFP out and then for the city and in this case it would be the mayor's leadership to reach out to businesses around the country that do this sort of thing and know what they're doing uh, the market house ought to be the center port of the city I mean it, it's right look I see it from my front porch when, when I come out of the house every morning uh, it ought to be the place that people come because it's uh, I won't go in there now I mean there's nothing there I need or want so um, absent that the market house is going it's going to continue to fester well it's funny I was talking with Alan Weitzman and Alan Hyatt yesterday, and they were talking about the focal points when you come into the city. Alan Hyatt and Severn Bank has it coming in at Westgate Circle. Alan Weitzman has it sort of off of Northwest Street in that iconic building right on the corner. You've got Market House, and then coming in from Eastport, you've got the Yacht Club, and you know, <laughs> down, downtown we've got a little bit of a... Well, I think the Yacht Club's going to heal itself here within the next year. Yeah, they're starting so, to do the construction now and yeah, everything else. Yeah, they got all permits and the construction's moving forward. And and I think this time the city did it right in, in terms of the permitting um, and making sure that... Yeah, they got that done the, real quick, though. <laughs> Well, he said if every business well, could go through the experience as flawlessly as the Yacht Club did, the business would be booming in town. Well, yeah, you know, well, I'll tell you one difference between that. You say they got their permits pretty quickly, but a difference between the Yacht Club and a business that's coming to Annapolis is uh, the members live here. Yeah. Oh. They've got a vested interest. The business doesn't. They're, they're looking True. to locate themselves here. True. Let's fast forward to December 3rd, 4th, whatever. You've won the you've won the race, yeah. Uh, you've had the inauguration at Maryland Hall, presumably, or whatnot. What's that's the only auditorium we have? Yeah, <laughs> so that's for, no, for, no, for now. For but now. Uh, what does Mayor Astle do on his first day of office? What when does city hours start? Do they start at seven a.m. Like, a <laughs> well, I <laughs> or I'm not sure what they start now, but um, I think the regular offices should be open nine to five every day. I think the mayor ought to be there earlier. But on day one, the first thing that needs to happen is. That meeting that you spoke of earlier, where I get all the department heads and we sit in a room and I say, okay, there's a, there's a new deal and this is how I intend to work with you. Uh, I'm going to lay out, I'm going to have these meetings so I make sure that what you have, you don't need anything from you to get what you need done, done. And then the next Monday we're going to talk about what you did get done. So there is assignment for certain um, tasks, and then there's accountability, because if you didn't get done what you told me you were gonna do, then I'd like you to explain to me why. And I'm not sure that happens now. I got intimidated while you were explaining that. He kept pointing at me and I was getting nervous. <laughs> yeah, the finger. <laughs> it's not the, the finger that people think of, it's the index. It's the mayoral, <laughs> yeah. the in where is your TPS report finger? <laughs> you know the city very well and everything else. And on that first day, are there, I'm not asking for names, but do you have a list in your mind? Are there changes that you want to make on day one, whether it be department heads or structure or whatnot that you have thoughts about? No, I, I'm going to tell you. Have you ever read The Prince by Machiavelli? Oh, I did. Mm -hmm. Have you? Yeah. Well, I have too. And one of the things that I learned when I read The Prince, you probably didn't realize I was so widely read. <laughs> but, um, one of the things that The Prince says is that when you become The Prince, you don't fire all the retainers from the previous Prince because they're going to be just as loyal to you as they were to him. They want to keep their jobs. Okay? And so give it some time because... There could be issues where the personality of the old prince didn't mesh with the personality of his retainers, or one or more of them. And now that situation could be different. So you want to be sure that you're not taking somebody who has the requisite experience to do the job and getting rid of them before you, you really know their capabilities and you've, you've not even thought about who you're going to replace them with. And there's continuity and institutional memory. And yeah. I think what you're saying also is that maybe there are people who weren't uh, being used to the, the best of their potential because yeah. there wasn't uh, a condition that was that was set up for them to be successful. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think you, you need to take your time in, in looking at that. In terms of the organization of the mayor's office, again, until I'm actually in the seat it's hard for me to make a judgment about the organization. Well, there's 13 department directors right now breathing a sigh of relief, at least for <laughs> at least for a couple of months. Well, I, I don't foresee a mass firing. I mean, right. It's just, it's not. Uh, look, regardless, 
of what direction I'd like to take the city, I'm going to need the expertise of many of those directors. And so the last thing that I would want to do is get rid of them um, before I had a chance to, to measure. Now, that said, we, were, we talked a little bit about restructuring. If you look at the actual structure of the city departments, is there anything that you would do to, for example, Mike, Mike did some restructuring uh, a little bit that he got some criticism, but I didn't think was a bad idea for what he was doing because you, know, you can consolidate certain departments that are supposed to interact with each other anyway and put it under the same roof. But do you think that the structure of the departments are efficient? You know, until I sit in a seat, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to give you a concrete answer on that. I will tell you that I heard that uh, the council is about to pass um, a bill that's going to take some of the functions that are now in the mayor's office out of the mayor's office and give them to the uh, um, city, city manager. manager. Yeah, Office of Law, um, the Public Affairs. So they would report to the city manager, and then the city manager would report to the mayor's to the office. Mayor. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that. If, if you have an effective mayor, the mayor's talking to the city manager on a regular basis. The mayor's the interface between the council and the city manager to ensure that, you know, things are working in the right direction. We've got a lot of um, capital issues, and you brought this up the last time we spoke. I know you said Main Street was a mess. Yeah, you, you thought infrastructure was something that had been neglected for a long and, time. Oh, I do. Mm. That's scheduled to be rebricked and restubbed and everything else starting in January. What other capital <laughs> projects? Just, if I may, I understand that the money for that's been in place for some time now, but it's been kicked down the road until after the election. Just so you know. That didn't go unnoticed. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, w one of the things that I learned early in life, when you're faced with an issue, you have to make a decision. You make the decision, and then you move forward. You know, uh, I'm going to digress for a moment and just tell you. I gave uh, Josh some issue or some advice about Crystal Springs, what, his first week in office. I took him out to lunch, and I said, Josh, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. Deal with this issue right now. It's the first year of your term. Deal with it and put it behind you. So I gave Mike Panelides the same advice. <laughs> and, and, and there's and, an issue that's going to span yeah, the end of two Yeah, two administration. Terms. So I'm going to take my own advice when the time comes. But, uh, and we were talking about that before you walked in, saying that Crystal Spring is one of those issues that has now spanned two elections. It's been an issue. Well, it's been longer than that. Yeah. That thing has been kind of percolating for 27 years. Has it really? Yeah. It, it, it's recently gotten on the screen, but uh, it's been out there for a long time. And quite honestly, there's so many facts out there, facts out there, and I don't know what... He did what, the quotey thing with his fingers. Yeah, yeah, I'm quoting with my fingers. <laughs> uh, it's not fake news. It's, no, just, no, it's, <laughs> it's just people have their version of what the facts are. Uh, I'd like to know what the real facts are before... Uh, we, I would move forward. And last week, Mayor Panaliti said in no uncertain terms that that as long as he has anything to say about it, it's not happening. Well, you know what? Too many of our decisions, development decisions, get decided by judges and not by those who've been elected. And I tell you, that's what will happen. If, if he tries to shut this whole thing down, it's going to be in court. And you'll have a judge making a decision that should be made by the people who've been elected to represent the community. And we'll see what happened, because last week, or it would be two weeks by the time everyone hears this, that uh, Crystal Spring, or I guess oh, we should be proper about this, the village at Providence Point, yeah. has, they submitted yet another, it's probably what, the sixth or seventh iteration of their plans, and... I've lost count. Yeah, yeah and it was summarily sent back, so you wonder at what point does it end up in court? And uh, I'm not sure, do they continue to uh, address the objections of the city when it comes to the plans, or do they say, you know, we're just tired of this, it's well, never I, happening? I, I would agree with that, um, but at some point, the decision has to be made and you got to move forward so you have to be careful when you make that decision that you've dotted your i's and crossed the t's or you'll find yourself in court do you think that we need that tax base we have some we we have some financial issues that are going to come to bear at some point you know whether it's five years ten years but we, we well no, let me just say america you have property rights, I should say, in America, in the United States. We have property rights, so you own a piece of property. You have the right to develop that to its highest and best use, consistent with existing law. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems we have now is that existing law is confusing. I talk to developers, talk to architects, talk to builders, and, and they'll say, look, I get an answer uh, from this person and then now I get a different answer from this person and I don't know what the real answer is. East Berlin is a perfect example of that example. exact thing. And so at some point 
somebody has to take the uh, the permitting and the zoning laws and, and rewrite them to a point so that they're clear and concise and easily understandable so there's no room for quibbling it says this and that's one of the things that most of the aldermen that i talked to and when we did interviews with them said is that the the zoning laws are just so incredibly complex and that you've had this document that's been plugged throughout the years and it's unrecognizable from what it was and they said that it really needs to start from top to bottom and be rewritten and and rewritten from the, the yep. get-go and, as opposed and to i believe that's the only way we're going to deal with this issue of uh, unbridled development. We have to have rules that are in place that people understand, and, and they can be enforced by, by the appropriate agency of government. Looking at um, some of the capital projects, okay, we, we did talk about Main Street. Yep. Um, we know that we've got a problem with city dock and flooding. Yep. Uh, we've got the city dock master plan that's hanging out there. Yep. We've got Hillman Garage. That's a big one. Where do you prioritize these, and how do you start to tackle them? Or do you run out of town? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm going to give you an answer today, but that answer could potentially change when I get in office and see what I actually have to deal with. So there's an asterisk after this one. There's an asterisk, right. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. For, uh, my writer. Here. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that uh, city dock flooding is increasingly going to be an issue, and it's one that has to be dealt with on the front side. If we wait too long, it's going to be too late, and, and we're going to have a very, very difficult time addressing it. And you know, the cost to do some of these things, you, you know, the old saw, pay me now, pay me later. Um, pay me now, it's sometimes cheaper. Pay me later. I'm going to get my interest and in, in the rest. So I, I think that's that's one that needs to be looked at. The, the garage, I think, is the next one because if we want to deal with downtown, that garage is crumbling. I mean, everybody knows, um, and I'm not sure we've got uh, the resources in place in our capital budget to do that project. So we're going to have to take a step back and see how we're going to deal with that, which I think kind of takes to the finances of the city. You know, I'm not sure that we've managed our money as well as we could have. We're borrowing money now to do operational things. Well, it's like if you go to the, the grocery store, but just stop by the bank with your ATM card to get a loan uh, before you go to the grocery store. So those monies we borrow should be used for capital, capital projects. Um, and, you know, we've got an aging infrastructure. Nobody wants to talk about this, but some of the water delivery systems in the city. I, I, I'm uh, laughing because I remember when Dave Cordell ran for mayor against Josh Cohen. He, yeah. he, he was a Democrat. I remember Dave kept running around with a briefcase in one hand and a rusty old corroded pipe <laughs> section in the other hand saying that this is what's lying underneath our city. He's right. Yeah. I mean, some of the, the water pipes uh, under the streets are aging they're even older than we are we <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm a spring chicken here what's that? uh hey, well, let's shift gears a little bit uh public housing yep uh housing authority of the city of annapolis and there's a lot of misnomers going on about what it is and it is a state chartered organization that is funded by federal dollars. grants federal, federal, federal government, government and yep. whatnot but not by the city and not by the state Nope. And they operate independent of the city, yep. independent of the state and the feds. Yep. However, the city appoints the board of commissioners. That's correct. And then they provide city services to the residents, you know, police and fire and EMS and water and, and, and whatnot. But we've got a problem with public housing. We're seeing that the decrepit conditions that we're seeing, we're seeing crime is certainly an issue. Where do you see the city's role in that going forward? Well, I know there's been some discussion about privatization of public housing, and I'm really not a fan of privatization because- Neither are the residents. Well, I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me give you an example. Um, a couple of states have tried to privatize the prison system. You know, that's a public function. You put a private entity in there, and the profit motive sometimes degrades the service that they're they're providing uh, for the institution. And I'm afraid that the same thing could apply here with public housing. Obviously, we need to address the condition of those buildings for the residents. But I think that's something that, that we need to work hand-in-hand, hand, the Board of Commissioners and the federal government. Well, with, decli it, with declining contributions from the federal government, which appears to be what, what's going to be happening now, certainly for the next four years, how do we address that? I mean, it's, it's any, the city know, doesn't have it. I know. 
Um, the state maybe could help in some way if they could free up some cash, but here's the problem. I don't think anybody in city government has taken the time to try to lobby um, the state or the federal government or their, their representatives, in this case our U.S. senators and the congressmen, um, to try to get something done. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen that happen. That's one of the things that uh, it's 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 an experience that I have is I know how to look up and ask you know look up and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and ask. <laughs> yeah, uh, somebody at the front of the bus has to be an advocate for those people in the back of the bus. You know we have two two communities here in Annapolis. We have one of affluence and influence, and one without. And I'm not sure that city government has really provided for those without. Certainly the ones with influence and, you know, they get things done because they have the affluence and the influence. But the ones without, I'm not sure they're getting the same kind of uh, care and feeding and treatment that, that they really deserve. I said that in, in the podcast that every town, every city thinks they're unique, but we really are unique in a lot of respects. And one of which is that we're geographically a small city, as important as it is, but we, we do have those pockets of affluence and poverty that are just on top of each other. You know, if you go to the giant on Bay Ridge, you have that serving Bay Ridge and it's also serving Robinwood. And, you know, yeah. and but you have these groups that are just in constant contact with each other. But, you know, you have the one group in public housing that for all intents and purposes are kind of kept out of sight, out of mind. I bet you that the vast majority mm -hmm. of white people or people in these affluent neighborhoods have never driven through Robinwood or Bywater. I would agree. Yeah. It's, so you, and, and, you know, one one little factoid, I've been told that we have the highest percentage of uh, subsidized housing than any city our size in the nation. Yeah, there's something something like 30 percent or 35 percent. I think that's a legit. I don't I don't think it's the it's been confused with saying we have the most public housing, but I, which is not certainly but not it's per true, capita. But it's. If you look at the 38,000 population versus the 1,200 units or whatever it is that they have in the yeah, the ratios uh, is, pretty, is pretty high. Is, is significant. But and this yeah. this goes to a rant that I think that John made on Ion Annapolis last week just about the inefficiency of government and it's that so many of these things have been kicked down the road to deal with later. The finances, the, the water treatment, uh, the infrastructure, the public housing. You know, this is a situation I'm in. I'm at home. I'm, you know, I'm trying to get another another year out of my car. I'm trying to get another uh, year out of my dishwasher. Sure. Try, so I have now I have five things that could, could go and I'm kicking myself at any given time. Before we were recording, you were saying pay me now or I guess you said this a few minutes ago, pay me now, pay me later later, I'm kind of screwed, but the city's in, the, in a worse situation because at some point, and it's not the fault of Mayor Panelides or, or Mayor Cohen or Moyer or going back through the history, it's just an accumulation of all these things that someone's going to be holding the bag on this at some point when they all start collapsing. It's an accumulation because previous administrations have kicked a can down the road and not dealt with those issues when they were before us, you know, at, a, at an appropriate time. I'm not pointing fingers at any one particular um, administration, but... I think they've all had cans they've been able, yeah. able, able to kick. I, mean, I don't think anybody's... And that's the most can. used phrase I've heard to describe our city government is just is kick the can down the road because we have that constantly. Well, it's easy to do that. No, I do but it in my are, personal life, too. Yeah, it's, yeah and people do. They're, they're reluctant to make the decisions. We have needs, and we've had needs all along. And you may have to put some aside to deal with the more important ones. And I'm not sure we've done that. The frustration that I think a lot of residents here and any other city have is that they don't know the why the decisions are being made that they're being made. And that comes down to transparency. Yep. And every, every administration across the country always says, I'm going to increase transparency. And it very rarely happens because that's just the nature of deal making. It's the nature of the process is that if, you know, if John and I want to agree to do something, we're going to have it take it offline and then come back. But then people see that is that it's lack of transparency. I think it's human nature too. There was a bill before the council last week about allowing theater use in some in, in specific zoning. And the first question that came to my mind, being the cynic that I am, is like, okay, so why? Why is you know why, why is this, this issue coming why up? Is Who's this coming pushing? In? Are we talking about is there a personal theater in a business that may want to have you know forty people see their clients? Are we talking about community theater, or is there one piece of land that's about to go on sale that AMC is looking to build build a megaplex here? And it's unfortunate that that is the attitude that I have, and I think a lot of people do. They sit there I and just think you're right. But he's also a conspiracy theorist, so you got to bear that in mind too. <laughs> okay. so. I haven't found a conspiracy that I won't jump into either, but. 
What do you do to increase well, or to maintain transparency well, in the national administration? let me just tell you my experience in, in state government. Um, our work, the hard work is done in committee. Um, we have the uh, uh, sunshine law. You, you know, you can't meet on an issue in a back room. That's against the law. So these meetings have to be open to the public. Every single vote that we take in committee is recorded. And you can go back and look and see votes on amendments, votes on, on bills themselves. I mean, it's all recorded, and anybody can go back. Everything that we do now is live streamed and is also recorded. So you can go back and listen to the testimony, listen to the discussion uh, at, that the committee has. And I think the same kind of thing ought to apply in city government. You know, you shouldn't be able to take a group in a back room, make a decision, then then bring it out and say, well, here's this is the answer. is what we're doing. I, I think the public has a right to be involved maybe not as active participants in the debate, but they need to be able to listen. And, mm -hmm. and I believe if you're afraid to talk about these things in the public eye, then you don't belong in the, in the game. This dovetails into who you are as a candidate. So if we look at the four candidates for mayor right now, by far, you have the most experience. I mean, even with Mayor Pat Lee, Panelides, who is the second most experienced, he's got three there's years. A vast, of a, there's a there's, vast there's a chasm. difference between those two. So there, so, I jokingly said I'm wait, waiting for Mike Panelides to look to Gavin and say, well, you know, you don't have the experience to be mayor. And I'd be like, well, let's, I seem to think that Josh Cohen had said that, said that four years ago. So with your experience and your name recognition, so you can look at it two different ways is the way is saying, well, you're an establishment politician, or you can say, but I also have the experience to know how to ask for money for the state. I know how the process works. So there's, there's a double-edged sword for the position that you're in right now, but by far you understand how government works, how bureaucracy works to the detriment, and, but all these issues that other candidates don't. But do you feel that you're able to take the experience you have from the state, kind of not to go back to the minors, but you're also coming, coming down to a smaller I, municipality? Know, I, I, let me first say that I'm not taking this for granted that because I've been in office as long as I have. And secondly, I don't see myself as an establishment candidate. You know, I've been in, I've been in the public eye now for 35 years, but at the same time, I had a real life outside. I had a real job, just like every other person in Annapolis. You know, I had to go to work. I, it was a fun job. I was flying helicopters <laughs> for a hospital, which is pretty neat. I was getting paid to play, sort of. But... Um, <laughs> I you just heard it here. He's all for pay for play. So. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I had uh, I had a real job and a real life. And so I think those experiences kind of separate you from the, the public arena. Talk about entrenched congressmen. Do they ever come home to their districts? You know, they're locked in Washington. The thing I like about the Maryland General Assembly is that every day when I left, I'm, I'm among the people I represent. When the session concluded, mm. I'm, I'm with the people I represent. So there was you never- You walked home. Yeah, I walked home. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about that for better or for worse. Yeah, You've got to walk back home through the people. There, there was no wall. Um, I see them in the grocery store. I, I see them at the doctor's office. I see them at the gas station. You know, So I'm not walled off from my constituents. And so in that, in that vein, I don't see myself as an established, establishment candidate. Now, the experience. Um, City government works a little bit differently in some respects. You know, the process is a little bit different than the process and the rules that we operated by in the state level. But some things don't change, and that's people and relationships. And I think the experience that I have in building coalitions and working with people um, is something that stands me would stand me in good stead as the uh, leader of the city. You know, I've said this before, and I'll just reiterate, the mayor is actually, by the charter, the president of the council. The mayor has one vote, just like every other member of the council. Only the mayor's supposed to vote first. Well, I don't mind voting first because that sort of sets the leadership tone. Mm. Um, so I, I think my experience in working with people is uh, going to benefit if I'm successful. Let me, um, I'm going to switch to, lately, the, a lot of the talk has been with the opioid crisis yeah. in Maryland. Yeah. And just last week, County Executive Shu had said that he's going to go forward and sue these doctors that are supplying pills and manufacturers and distributors and whatnot there. The numbers are staggering coming from Anne Arundel County, where the third highest jurisdiction in the state of Maryland as far as heroin overdoses and deaths behind Baltimore City and Baltimore County. 
The city has obviously been involved. We, we've been impacted by it. The city is involved with trying to control it or stem that tide. What do you see that we can do to help keep our youth, our kids, and this is out of both parts of Annapolis, the, the yeah. aff- affluent and influential ones as well as the ones that don't yeah. have it out of the op- The opioid epidemic. Let me try that again. The opioid ap- epidemic affects all classes. I mean, it, it runs the gamut. It's not just in the in the the, the class that doesn't have it. Um, I think there are a couple of things. You know, we did a thing in the in the General Assembly, a bill that passed, which said that you're a doctor and you're prescribing opioids to a patient. You have to enter that into a um, website. It's on record. So spoke. I'm going to point to him. Please, this time. yeah, John. So yeah, he's you, the one you go in. And, uh, and your doctor writes you a, a prescription for painkillers, opioid drugs. Now you go to another doctor and you try to get another prescription. Well, now that doctor's required by law to go on that website and he sees, huh, you, 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 you already got a dozen You already got pills. some, and so he, he better refuse. Because what will happen, the doctor's actions are going to be monitored. Um, monitored as well and so we're going to know which doctors are prescribing and the numbers i just saw a thing actually it was on steve shoes um, um, press conference this woman said that her her kid got started on painkillers i know the new england journal of medicine said that 70 percent of today's opioid addicts got their start with a prescribed painkiller yeah which is staggering and so when you when you look at what the doctors prescribe, the numbers of pills that they prescribe, I, I think it's excessive. It's just my opinion. I mean, I've had some procedures done where I was given the prescription for pain pills, and then I decided the pain wasn't that bad. I could deal with it with, you know, an, an aspirin. Or for crying out loud, you're a marine. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I, know. <laughs> I would expect that's, nothing less. That's right. I it's, want to bike it in we, for we a hangnail. We don't need no stupid painkillers. <laughs> so, so yeah, but. And, and I never filled the prescriptions because I just, um, but the doctor was pretty free about writing that prescription down here. You know, you feel a little pain. Well, you know, if we become so soft that we can't endure a little pain. I think suing the, the doctors and the, and the drug manufacturers may be a potential solution, but I think that's going to require action of the General Assembly. I'm not sure that, that the county council has the ability to, uh, to do that unilaterally just with Anne Arundel County. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know uh, the answer to that, but that's my, my, I suspect. Well, it's certainly something I think we need to look at. Uh, but it's it's a terrible problem, and it, we're killing people at an incredible rate. Um, so I don't know. So, like you said, you've had a long career in the uh, legislature, and with your job of flying helicopters and getting paid for it. So why not just uh, get a beach house somewhere? Why are you uh, why are you running for mayor? It's a good question, and it's one See, he's got John. a house, and he wants See? to go to the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, the, not the beach. He's not a beach I've guy. been asked that question a number of times. Your wife? <laughs> what the and hell are wife, you doing? <laughs> yeah, so why don't you just retire? Um, I'm doing this because I love this city. I've been here now for over 40 years. Bought my house in 1971. Wow. Um, I raised two kids here in the city. My youngest is is buried here. This is my home. I'm not going away. But I care about the city. As a state legislator, on a couple of occasions, I've tried to reach down and provide some assistance or a couple of issues to the city. And I never got any cooperation. And I finally came to the realization that if I was going to make the kind of changes that I wanted to see in my community, I was going to have to drive the bus. And so I don't see stepping from position as a senator to a mayor as a step down. Uh, in some ways, it's a step up. As a legislator, I got one vote. I'm one of 188 people. As a mayor, I may only have one vote on the council, but I've got a more powerful voice that I don't have necessarily as a member of the Senate. So I don't see it as a step down. I'm, I'm interested. You said that as a legislator, you had seen a lack of cooperation between the state level and the city level. And with the exception of Dean Johnson for one term yeah, and Mayor Panelides for one term at this point, um, it's all been a Democrat-controlled legislature versus a Democrat city council. Why is Why would there not be cooperation there? I mean, we're seeing some more cooperation now that there's a Republican in government house in Calvert Street. <clears throat> 
You know, first of all, I'm not sure that city elections ought to be partisan. You know, the issues, the issue of Main Street doesn't have a partisan label on it. I mean, it's it's a, a need that needs to be met. It's a decision that needs to be made. Those water pipes aren't Republican yeah, or Democrat. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, unfortunately, that's the way it is. It's a, And so the parties have this incentive, uh, imperative, I guess is even a better word, that we got to win. we got to win. So what's it mean? I told somebody on the street today, party affiliation doesn't necessarily indicate quality. You know, you, you could be a Democrat and not have the quality to be a successful office holder. You could be a Republican and not have the quality. But because your party seems to have an edge, um, suddenly you're in office and you're expected to make decisions. I mean, how about the chairman of the county council now? There's a guy. <laughs> <laughs> We'll cut your mic off at that. <laughs> so, well, I'll, t- I'll tell you. We I didn't are- call a name out. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you say Gracia, that would be indiscreet. Yes, so I'll say don't it. say Gracia. <laughs> so yeah. I'll throw that out. Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you what I want. Thank you very much for your time. We're going to wrap up here. Best of luck in the election. I, uh, you know, obviously we're seeing the astral signs pop. Popping, popping up, popping up, and I cannot open my Facebook around without town. seeing you come up like every other post. So well yeah. done, like <laughs> mushrooms in the night. That's my signs. Yeah. They're, they're coming up. <laughs> you know, there was it was a planned thing. Uh, people kept saying, "Where are your signs? Where are your signs?" In any of the elections I've been involved in, I never get the signs out until we're like maybe three to four weeks out. Is that because of the short-term memory of the, the voters? That yeah. it's I mean, suddenly they, they stop seeing your signs. When they, when they crop up, all of a sudden it's like, wow, his signs are up. Just the explosion. Yeah, as opposed to getting immune to them, driving by, it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, there's that whatever sign. Interesting. Yeah. This so, should be like uh, former county executive Leopold, just have one sign. You could save some money. It's a lot of waving, though. <laughs> One sign. Well, he didn't have anybody else helping him either. And the sign never said what he was running for. <laughs> yeah, it was just, just a... But he had a nice wave. It was wave. a cost-saving measure. <laughs> yeah, it was okay. a cost-saving measure. Um, and speaking of that, that's something that uh, we're going to employ in, in my campaign is uh, waving. Waving? <laughs> yeah, I've done it. Um, I, I, just, I just laughed and he just shot me a look, so I just stopped laughing. Well, <laughs> no, I, uh, I didn't mean to shoot you a look. I mean, I can or he shot my, you a look. I can say look to my wife. So <laughs> um, no, you know, sign waving, people drive by. So maybe they didn't have a sign in their neighborhood, but <clears throat> here's one in their faces. They're coming down <laughs> the street. And it shows, uh, particularly for the volunteers, they're the ones that really care about signs. You know, it shows that you're actually doing something. Well, you guys certainly are everywhere, and I want to thank you again for uh, stopping well, in today and well, talking to us. I hope you guys invite me back again. Uh, we're going, well, yeah, I mean, hopefully that we will. We'll have you guys back, and we're going to be having our, uh, our debate coming up in a few weeks. John's doing the organizing on that. And, and uh, just to get into a... Uh, little bit of business on the 19th of September. That is the primary election. And if you are registered in the city of Annapolis as a Democrat or Republican, get out and vote and uh, get this turnout that's been dismal for years and years and years and really show uh, show the world what Annapolis can do. We need to do better than that. And uh, 19th of September, we do not have any early voting in this city. No, we, we do not, not in the city. But let me just say it's to the, the, the people who are listening, it's your government. And you have to take some responsibility to ensure that it's what you want. Vote. All right. Leave it at that. Thank you very much, Senator. Appreciate that. Senator John Astle. And we're doing something we never, ever do. We have a little bit of tricks of editing. So we will record a bunch of intros and outros at the same time and inter- interviews later or interviews before. But this time we did everything in order. So we sat down to the intro. The senator came in and then he just left a couple seconds ago. Absolutely. Um, so I have no editing to do. Okay. I The plan for this outro mm-hmm. was for me to talk about my thoughts on the entire race for the Napa City. And that's all screwed up there. I'm, I need to rethink this whole mayor thing again now that we've spoken with all four candidates for mayor. And I think that's probably screwed up everybody else too. So go back and listen to the other three episodes, including this one, because we've got Gavin Buckley was up first, then Nevin Young, and then Mike Panalides, and now Senator John Astle. I'm going to tear down this fourth wall completely and be completely candid. So before we start all this back in the beginning of the summer, before we interviewed everyone, privately we chatted saying, oh, it's going to be tight. But I thought it was John. John's going to run away with John Astle, and, and he certainly is formidable. But I think the other candidates have really upped their game, too. So this is going to be a really good race because I don't know right now. They're all really strong. They're all stronger than I thought they would be. And I think I, th- uh, I think we've got to put some more thought on that. But. I can talk a little bit, and I'm not going to waver on my aldermanic 
prognostications or my guesses there. But uh, so I'll just I'll just throw this out here and I'll just go one one by one and see if you agree with me. As far as the Alderman races, okay, go. What's gonna happen? Ward one, I think Ellie Tierney defeats Joe Budge in the primary, and she'll defeat Larry Clausen in the general election. Uh, I agree. I think it's be close, but I agree. Okay, and I think I think Ellie and Joe will be very close in the primary. Ward two, uh, Fred Payone won over Kurt Regal last election by 54 votes or something along those lines. I think that Kurt is going to take it this time. I think that he's been actively out there campaigning. I think that Fred has been a little bit lax on the campaigning. And I think, you know, part of that is Dewey's, he had a hip replacement and whatnot. So there's a physical limitation right now as he's going through the recovery there. But I think that's going to hurt him. And I think because it was so close before, uh, I think Kurt's going to take that one. Okay. Another close one. So I, I don't know if I agree or disagree, but I think that's too close to call for me. Okay. Fred's, Fred's got the, uh, he's got the strength of an incumbency. Yeah. Ward three going on uh, an absolute limb here. And I'm going to say Rhonda Pindell Charles is going to take that. Sure. Okay. Uh, Ward four. I think Sheila Finlayson will also win this. We've got, two, win. we've got two Democrats there, but I bet you it's going to be, and I'm putting my fingers together really close in front of the microphone right now. I think it's going to be a lot closer than anybody ever thinks with Sheila Finlayson because I think Tony Strong Pratt is a very, very formidable candidate. Yes, she is. And Sheila is still going to win, but I think it's going to be very, very tight. And uh, Tony Strong Pratt, I think you'll see a little bit more of her in the future. Ward 5, which is sort of the Hunt Meadow Ward and, and Pitt Moy Rec Center, I think that Mark Rodriguez will take this race. Uh, he's been campaigning for quite a long time. He's been active in the community. He's been helping Alderman Lippman for a year and a half now, doing constituent service and everything else. James Appel, um, it could be a dark horse that comes in there, but I don't see it. I think Mark Rodriguez will take that by a fairly significant margin. Mm-hmm. Uh, where are we at? 5-6. I think Shanika Henson is going to take that over Dewan Gay. I think Dewan's got a little bit of name recognition over Shanika. But I think Shanika just really understands the issues of the city and really, you know, really resonates with her. And she's able to discuss them and, and come up with a strong plan on how she wants to She is it. impressed the hell out of me, though. He's 19, 20 years old. He is one to watch. He oh, is, oh, oh. He with, is with amazing. Without a doubt. I mean, not... Do, I, this, I don't think, is Dewan's time, but no, Dewan has time coming. That is a smart, smart kid, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to denigrate him by calling him a kid. He, he's, he's a smart guy. Yeah, I'm not going to say that, that he should not win, but I, I just don't think he will. But he's definitely one to watch there on that Ward 6 uh, and, and beyond. You may, you may see him pop up uh, in the school board or something like that as well. It'll be interesting to see, follow his career as it goes on. And seven's the most interesting race, I think, out of all of these. Ward, Ward 7, I think that Rob Savage is going to take Alexis Viegas in the primary by a fairly significant vote. I don't think it's going to be as close as you think it is. Um, I, I think it'll be fairly significant. I think that uh, or, I, I Rob think has been around. Be He's got the name recognition and everything else. Alexis seems to be doing almost like she's reading a textbook, I think, on how to do run a campaign. And I think she seems a little bit out of touch with the needs or the desires of the ward. Uh, Rob, I think, is a little bit I don't more understand Ward in 7 in general anyway. It, that's hard to get your... The, the personality of ward, ward 7 is hard to get your uh, get, a, get a touchstone on. That doesn't even make sense, but you know what I mean. It's, it's hard to figure them out, what what their identity is, what they care about. Well, that's, and that's where Dave Frankel comes in. And I think David Frankel will ultimately win this in the general election. He is the Republican candidate. I think Rob Savage is going to be seen as a one, one issue, you know, one trick pony, if you will. He's very focused on the environment. His editorial on the Capitol last week was very, very focused environment, environment, environment. I think David has a little bit more of a broader appeal and a broader vision of the ward on that seven word eight that's you that was me the first time ever that was you first time ever um word eight is good is my big upset and uh senator astle thought really uh when i when i told him this too but i think bumper moyer is going to take ross arnett in the primary by just a little little bit and i think that's because of bumper's history he's grown up there forever both of his parents served as aldermen and mayors of the city uh, I think a lot of people are going to see it as bumpers time. And I think they're going to have the longtime East Porters are going to find it hard to not vote for Bumper Moyer. However, come the general election, I think Julie Musog is ultimately much more qualified than Bumper Moyer. And I think she will ultimately win that seat in a large, by a large margin. Let me say this too, large Marge. Let me just say this too, is that, and by the way, let me preface this by saying that I'm not running for anything. I don't work for anybody. So I am not trying to preserve anyone's feelings because I don't care. 
I will say that if you look across the slate of aldermanic candidates, there's not one person there who doesn't deserve uh, at least a shot at this because they are all remarkably capable. There's not even one when I turn off the mic that I'd say, well, except for, I'm being honest, every single one of these aldermanic can- candidates is pretty impressive. I-, I don't think there's anyone that really that, slacks. It, that is an impressive group of all 18, of and 18 I, I'm individuals. Serious. That's, that's, I, I'm not just saying that to kiss ass. I'm really not. I, I think it's it's a great sign for the city where you have so many people who are so qualified who are willing to fight for the position to serve the city. I really do. Yeah. I think we are going to have a surprise guest in a couple of weeks here who's going to help break down all of the electoral information and kind of give their professional opinion about what they're doing, how they're doing it, the way people are going to vote, and we're going to have a really fun one with that. So we'll do that for the aldermanic and the mayoral election. But if you haven't listened to all the aldermanic interviews, go back and listen to those. If you haven't listened to all of the mayoral candidate interviews, go back and listen to those. And if you want to find us on Facebook, we have a group, we have a page. You can find us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast. Uh, we're at Tim Hamilton 47 at Ion Annapolis. You can send us an email at info at the MarylandCrabs.com. Find us at the MarylandCrabs.com. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. Rate us, uh, comments, blah, 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 all that stuff. And subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. See you next week. Next week. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.